Hello and welcome to this Red Gamer Tech video, myself and Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Do forgive my voice still guys, I am a little bit better than I was yesterday but still under the weather as you can hear. However, to keep things off today I have something from the Ryzen 3000 series. So. What do we actually have here? Well, we actually have a Geekbench result for the long-rumoured Ryzen 3000 series of APUs. Now, this particular Geekbench result, of course, shows an APU that found its home in a laptop, and these come to our thanks to the rather famous leaker, Tom Apisak. Now, we have the 300U, 3200U, 3300U, 3500U, and 3700U, and no, I didn't misspeak that 300U naming is correct. It is possible it is a lower-end chip. However, we have the scores for the Ryzen 3200U with Vega Mobile, Ryzen 3 3300 obviously with Vega, and obviously the Ryzen 5 3500U also with Vega. So what do we actually have in terms of scores then, I hear you ask? Well, for the 3200U, we see a Geekbench single core score of 2187-2358 and a multi-core score of 4524 to 6924. For the 3300U, we see 3654 on the single core and 9686 on the multi core. And for the 3500U, we see 3776 to 3870 on the single core and then on the multi core 9787 to 11284. Now, things, another thing, excuse me, also catches my eye, and that is that. Geekbench lists the architecture as Raven Ridge, which heavily points to the fact that they are using similar architectures here. But of course, that could very well be that these are early, early samplings, engineering samples, all that sort of stuff. Now, there's a very recent and um, test run, by the way, on the 12th and the 13th, so today and yesterday, if that is correct. So I would fully expect to see more on this from Lisa Sue when she makes her appearance at CES in January. Obviously, it's not confirmed by any means that they're going to discuss Ryzen 3. Um, sorry, Zen, yeah, Ryzen 3000 or Zen 2, I suppose just to say. But I would be surprised if they don't. And obviously, they're most likely going to be telling us a little bit about what's going on with Navi as well. Now, for our next topic, we're actually going to go over to Intel for a second. Now, I discussed yesterday all of the news that we had from Intel's Architecture Day. And we have a bit more for you on that today as I have come across some rather lengthy statements from Raja Kadori, who is of course Senior Vice President of Core and Visual Computing over at Intel and he has outlined their shift in strategy basically and there's a rather lengthy Intel newsroom article about this. I'm not of course going to go through all of the information here because I'm here be here until next Christmas, not even the one that's in like two weeks, the one that's like in 2019, that's that's how long it would take, just just, just so I'm clear. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just going to go through sort of the key points of what Raja had to say here regarding Intel's plan for the future. Now the most interesting thing that kind of informed most of the questions and Raja's answers were how their sort of design and approach is going to be across six strategy pillars. We've got process, architecture, memory, interconnect, security, and software. They pretty much speak for themselves as to what they are. So, in terms of the questions, we have quite a few of them here, but again, I'm just going to cherry pick the best of them. And one of them I'm going to mention, just because I'm sure a lot of people are wondering how Raj has been finding Intel ever since he left AMD for their direct competitor. And he said, quote, when I joined Intel, I was amazed at the sheer volume and breadth of IP available to us. In nearly three decades in the industry, I've never seen anything like it. The scale of these resources gives us differentiated sets of technologies in each of these pillars to apply as we drive wave after wave of innovation for client, edge, and cloud computing environments. I believe we are uniquely positioned to deliver leadership across all six of these pillars, which provides foundation for sustained innovation nobody else can offer. Now, the, f the next question I want to discuss here is how do Intel's investments in the six pillars drive Moore's law like leap forward in user experience? And to which Raja had to say, quote, in the previous generations, the answer has been that transistor density and Moore's law will play the lead role in solving computer computing problems. 
but as the process node transitions have slowed from the pace of previous decades, it is the essence of Moore's law that continues to provide new, ne new technologies and capabilities to meet the demands of modern computing. The message of Moore's law is more about tran than transistors alone, with the combination of transistors, architectural research, connectivity advancements, faster memory systems, and software working together to drive it forward. Now the last thing from these list of questions that I want to touch on is basically why they have felt the need to kind of change their model for product innovation. To which Raja had to say, quote, the world has changed and so has our business. We've moved to target an addressable market north of $300 billion. The rising demand for computing provides us with a chance to change moles and expand Intel in an unprecedented manner. We have a responsibility not only to ourselves, but also to our customers who trust us with their businesses, critical data and computing needs to reinvent our products and strategy for developing technologies for the decade and beyond. But there you have it, just a few sort of key things that Raja discussed during the Intel Architecture Day. You will find in the description below this video a link to the Intel Newsroom article. We will also find a bunch of pictures from the events and it looks actually more low-key than I was expecting, I'm not going to lie. But that's not the only Intel thing I have for you today, as we have a B365 Express chipset launching from them. So what we have here is a new motherboard chipset to kind of sandwich in between the B360 and H370 Express chipsets, respectively. And it is on the 22NM HK, HK excuse me, MG Plus Silicon node. I've discussed before how they're kind of moving over to 22NM for some stuff to free up 14NM++ for processors. Of course, they are pretty much dying for 14NM, as you know. And we do see similarities but also additions and subtractions versus the b360 it has a wider pcie downstream root complex 20 gen 3 lanes and the b360 only has 12 however we see a complete lack of integrated 10 gbps usb 3.1 gen 2 but you do still get 8 5 gbps usb 3.0 but a lack of the latest gen of wireless ac integrated mac so it's most likely a rebrand, perhaps with the Z170, perhaps not, but it is most likely just a rebound, a rebrand, excuse me, with some features stripped out and some added. Obviously not going to be the top of the line anytime soon. So we're going to move over to something from Facebook as their lawsuit with Zenimax has finally come to a close. Now, you might have to stretch your memory back a little bit on this one because it's been going on for that long. Basically, this was a lawsuit regarding the alleged theft of Zenimax's code and info that was apparently then used to develop Oculus products. So we have now have a settlement between Facebook and Zenimax. And I have a bit of a statement here from Zenimax chairman and CEO Robert Altman who said, quote, we are pleased that a settlement has been reached and are fully satisfied by the outcome. I would dislike litigation and will always vigorously defend against any infringement or misappropriation of our intellectual property by third parties. Now, unfortunately, they didn't say what the settlement actually was. Now, again, just a bit of a refresher. Zenimax were claiming that the Oculus founder, Palmer Lucky, took Zenimax's code and proprietary information and then used it to develop Oculus products and also alleged that John Carmack, who used to work for Zenimax, also used his experience and knowledge from working there to bring improvements to the VR headset. Now you may recall back in February of last year, jury, a jury, excuse me, did find Oculus guilty of copyright infringement, failure to declare with an NDA and misuse of Oculus trademarks. However, this was then appealed by Facebook because the original award was 500 million. This was then reduced to 250 million. And now this settlement has come after both sides were still appealing the verdict. So we know that both of those numbers were thrown around but we know that neither of them were the number that was eventually settled on but unfortunately we don't know what it actually was but the point is this long saga of this lawsuit has finally finally come to an end so let's end with the shall we rather i can do words that's right <laughs> with something rather cool from epic now i have to say i say it was it was pretty cool it's really damn cool 
Now, just to kind of preface this a little bit, you undoubtedly recalled the, earlier this year the kerfuffle that happened around Fortnite due to the lack of crossplay on the PS4 when, of course, it's available on the Switch, the PC, and the Xbox One. And Sony were being very, very stubborn for reasons that made no sense, to be quite frank. And obviously, they eventually crumbled, but uh, they were stubborn for quite some time. Now, Epic were obviously really keen on you know, bringing that for Fortnite and now they have taken what they've learned and they're going to be offering a free, I do repeat, free service that will help other developers add crossplay to their games. So we have a bunch of solutions on offer here. Again, I've got a direct quote from Epic's blurb here, which reads, quote, these services will be free. I just knocked my mic. I'm sorry. These services will be free for all developers and will be open to all engines, all platforms, all stores. As a developer, you're free to choose mix and match solutions from Epic and others as you wish. And we have various features. We have cross port platform login, friends, presence, profile, and entitlements. And this provides core functionality for recognizing players across multiple sessions and devices, identifying friends. And this is going to support PC, Mac, iOS, Android, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch to the full extent each platform allows. We also see a PC and Mac overlay. This is for login, friends, and so on and so forth. This is cro we also have cross-platform voice comms. So they've got their own in-game voice communication service for all platforms, all stores, and again, it's going to be available for free. And um, they are working on this, as they do say in their blurb, or they, they are keen to point out the, the existence of things such as Ventrilo, Desk, Discord, TeamSpeak, and so on. We also have cross-platform parties and matchmaking, data storage, cloud save games, as well as achievements and trophies. Now, they are very clear that a lot of this is a work in progress. For example, the cross-platform login is Q2, Q3, 2019 to PC and other platforms throughout next year. PC Mac overlay is Q3, 2019. Voice comms is Q3, 2019. The parties and match matchmaking is Q3 to 4, 2019. Uh, data storage and cloud save is Q2. And the achievements and trophies is Q3. So this is not out tomorrow by any means, but I love this. I really love this. Now, obviously, Epic, we're also keen to stress, look, you might have some platform-based limitations that are beyond our control, but they are really trying to make everyone's life easier to put their games on as many platforms as possible, and all for free. So they have clearly taken what they've learned with Fortnite and just put it to really, really good use. So do you know what? Two thumbs up from me, Epic. That's a... That's a good one, what can I say? Anyway, that's me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated, and I'll see you next time.